You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In the previous session, we were talking about how the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam continued his journey through the heavens on the night of al Isra al Mi'raj, crossing through all the seven heavens until finally he reached above there to Sidratul Muntaha. And the Prophet Sallallahu describes Sidratul Muntaha, this, this station, this place that is the highest most place that any of the creation of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reaches. And he describes <clears throat> how beautiful it is. And he also tells us about seeing Jibreel Alayhi Salam in his true actual physical form there. And finally the Prophet Sallallahu tells us about the fountain of Al-Kawthar and the gift that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu now the Prophet ﷺ goes on a tour of basically the unseen, the ghayb. The Prophet ﷺ, it goes on to mention the narration, وَرَأَ الْجَنَّةَ مِن دُرَّةٍ بَيْضَى فَإِذَا فِيهَا جَنَابِذُ اللُّؤْلُؤْ The Prophet of Allah ﷺ then saw paradise, he saw Jannah. And he toured Jannah and he talks about seeing pearls. And he talks about seeing جَنَابِذُ اللُّؤْلُؤْ which are basically pearls and gems and rubies that are the size of in like the size of a dome and he sees these huge pearls and rubies فَقَالَ يَا جِبْرِيلِ إِنَّهُمْ يَسْأَلُونِي عَنِ الْجَنَّةِ he tells his travel companion Jibreel alayhi salam that people constantly are asking me about paradise <clears throat> فَقَالَ أَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّهَا قِيعَان تُرَابُهَا الْمِسْكِ Jibreel alayhi salam tells the Prophet ﷺ that tell them that Jannah is a wide open area and it's soil that is very fertile, which Ibrahim alayhi salam had told the Prophet ﷺ about as well. But he said, tell them that the soil is like musk. And while the Prophet ﷺ is taking this tour of paradise in Jannah, he can hear a light sound almost like footsteps on the ground. He can see, hear it coming in from outside. And that's very strange, not only because is he hearing a sound, but the fact, you know, oftentimes the nicer a car is, the more soundproof it is, right? And the nicer your home is, then the less noise you can hear from outside. What's a nicer place in Jannah and Paradise? Yet he can hear a sound coming in from outside, so it's very bizarre. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu says, Ya Jibreel, ma hadha, what is this? How can a sound from outside be coming into paradise? فَقَالَ جِبْرِيلِ Bilal al muaddin That this is Bilal the muaddin of the, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That when he walks on the ground, his footsteps echo in the heavens. This man has such weight, such greatness, such magnitude in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is so blessed by Allah that when he walks on the earth, the people of the, he- the ones in the heavens can hear him walking on the earth. And this narration here, because it's not necessarily part of the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, so all it does is mention this, and it goes on from here. But when the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu returned back from the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, and he saw Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu the following day, the narration goes on to mention that he tells, Ya Bilal, what is it that you do, that when you walk on the earth, I can hear your footsteps in the heavens? What is it that you do? And he says, Ya, ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, whenever I am not in a state of purity, whenever I, like we would say, lose my wudu, I immediately, I don't wait, I don't waste any time, I immediately go and perform wudu. I continue to put myself in a state of cleanliness, and as soon as I enter into that state of wudu, I don't waste that opportunity, I seize that as an opportunity to worship Allah, and I go and I pray at, the, at a minimum of two raka'at. This is of course before the obligation of five times daily prayer, which occurred now on the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. But he says even then, salah was already there from the very beginning. I didn't clarify, or I, 
I believe I've spoken about this in an earlier, earlier session. When revelation, when we talked about the first revelation coming to the Prophet ﷺ, but a lot of times it's a misunderstanding amongst Muslims that we think that when the five times daily prayer was ordained on the journey of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, that, that there was no salah before that. But that's, that's, that's a fallacy, that's incorrect. Salah was there from the very beginning. And if you recall, and those who, who might not have read this or heard this before, go and listen to the podcast about the earlier revelations. And we talk about how the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, when the first revelation came to him, and he came back home and he kind of was given a few days to acclimate himself to this profound experience, Jibreel ﷺ comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, please accompany me. And they go to the haram to the point where the Prophet ﷺ can see the Kaaba not too far away from there, but a little bit tucked away in a corner. And there Jibreel ﷺ strikes the ground and water started to shoot out of the ground. A spring came forth. And Jibreel ﷺ told the Prophet ﷺ that this is an offshoot from the well of Zamzam. Because if I take you there and you make wudu there, the, 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 it'll attract too much attention and it could lead to some harm coming to you. So by the command of Allah as a miracle, as a gift to you, here's an offshoot from Zamzam. And Jibreel a.s. made wudu and taught the Prophet to make wudu. Then he said, come with me. And he stood up and he prayed while the Kaaba was in sight. And he prayed to Raka'at and the Prophet ﷺ prayed along with him. And Jibreel ﷺ taught the Prophet ﷺ how to pray. Just the basic form of the prayer, two Raka'at. Before that, before the obligation of the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ used to just simply pray units of two. In the morning, in the evening, whenever a situation came up, whenever a circumstance came about, the Prophet ﷺ would pray two Raka'at. So Salah was there from the very beginning. And not only that, but Salah has been there in the practice of all the Anbiya. Of all the Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, Ibrahim alayhi salam makes a dua, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem, muqeem as salah. If there was no salah, why is he making dua? Oh Allah, give me consistency in prayer. If there is no salah, but of course there was. Ismail alayhi salam, Allah says about him in Surah Maryam, Surah 19, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ salah. He used to tell his family to pray. He used to remind his family to pray. Allah tells us about Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha, Surah 20, that when he was made a Nabi and a Prophet and given wahi, divine revelation, Allah told him, وَأَقِمِ salata li dhikri Establish prayer for my remembrance, to remember me. Allah tells us about Isa ibn Maryam, Isa alayhi salam, in Surah Maryam, in Surah 19, that he says, um, وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّا My Lord has firmly commanded me to stick to prayer. So salah has been a constant even Maryam. يَا مَرْيَمْ أُقُنُّتِي لِرَبِّكِ وَاسْجُدِي وَارْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ O Maryam, be obedient to your Lord and do sujood and do ruku' وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ وَارْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Who is that addressed to? يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ to Banu Israel, the nations of the past. Salah has been a constant. It is, the, it is the consistent way of communicating and connecting to Allah. So Salah has always been there, and that's why after the Prophet ﷺ shares the message with Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, his beloved wife, the first believer, he also takes her and they make wudu together, and then they pray together. Ali bin Abi Talib sees them praying together and asks, Ya Muhammad ma hadha? Oh Muhammad, what are you doing? And then the Prophet ﷺ explains it to him and Ali bin Abi Talib accepts Islam. So Salah was there from the very beginning. So going back to the point here, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu's footsteps are echoing in the heavens while the Prophet ﷺ is taking a tour of Jannah on the night of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj. And Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu informs him, I constantly renew my wudu. I don't stay out of wudu. And whenever I make wudu, I don't waste the opportunity, I pray. So this is a little bit of a side point here. فَسَارَ فَإِذَا هُوَ بِأَنْهَارٍ مِنْ لَبْنٍ لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ طَعْمُهُ وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ خَمْرِ لَذَةِ لِلْشَارِبِينَ وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ عَسَلٍ مُصَفَّةٍ We've read these ayat in the Qur'an. Allah tells us that there are rivers in paradise, streams in paradise of milk that will never go sour, streams and rivers of the pure wine of paradise and rivers and streams of pure honey. And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was able to witness these things with his own eyes on, on this journey. وَإِذَا رُمَّانُهَا كَدِّلَا The Prophet ﷺ says the pomegranates, the fruit of paradise was the size of a bucket. They were that huge that they were the size of buckets. 
وفي رواية فإذا فيها رمان كأنها كأنه جلود الإبل المقتبة. The Prophet ﷺ says that in another narration that the fruits of paradise, specifically, he mentions the pomegranates. They were so huge that the Arabs had a practice. One thing that they would do is when they when they would sacrifice um, a camel, they would take the skin, the hide of the camel, and to dry it out and stretch it out, what they would do is that they would have like these domes. And they would stretch it out over the dome. So imagine how huge the hide and the skin of a camel would be stretched out over a dome. The Prophet ﷺ said that's how huge the fruits of paradise were. And وَإِذَا بِطَيْرِهَا كَالْبَخَاتِ The Prophet ﷺ says that the birds of paradise were the size of camels in this dunya. That's how huge the birds of paradise were. And of course, another narration of the Prophet ﷺ tells us that human beings will be 60 feet tall, so everything is in proportion. So it's not like, we'll be this size, and all of a sudden there's a bird flying by the size of a camel, because that would be quite terrifying. So the, everything will be in proportion. So the Prophet ﷺ, but he's witnessing this, you know, in his human form, in his worldly form, and he says that the birds were the size of camels. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, as, ya Rasulullah, inna tilka tayra nam, uh, lanam, lana'ima. He says, Ya Rasulullah, those birds, that, that, they must be amazing. The Prophet ﷺ says, Akhlatuha an'amu minha. He says, they taste even better. He says, they taste even better than they look. He didn't elaborate further how he knew they, how good they tasted. But I guess some, some things are for personal information. Wa inni la arju an ta'kula minha. But the Prophet ﷺ says, that I hope, which is a way of saying that I'm giving you the good news, Ya Aba Bakr, that you will be one of those people who will eat the birds of paradise. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, you will go to Jannah. You will go to paradise, you will enjoy all the blessings of paradise, he lets him know. وَبَيْنَا هُوَ يَسِيرٌ بِنَهْرٍ وَبَيْنَا هُوَ يَسِيرٌ يَسِيرٌ بِنَهْرٍ عَلَى حَافِتَيْهِ الدُّرَ الْمُجَوَّفِ The Prophet ﷺ says he was continuing to walk down along this river in paradise and all of a sudden he sees this huge pearl that was hollowed out. A huge pearl that was hollowed out and it was a palace carved inside of out of a singular pearl. And I mentioned last time the narration tells us that the ceilings are 30 feet, 30,000 feet high. It has 70,000 rooms. And at the door of every single room, there are a thousand angels welcoming that person every single time that person enters or exits the room, waiting on that person of Jannah, hand and foot. وَإِذَا طِينَةُ طينة مِسْكْ أَذْفَرْ And the, even the soil on the banks of the river smelled like musk. It was very fragrant. And then some, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, or, or rather, excuse me, the Prophet sallallahu says, this stream, this river that I'm walking by, what is this, Ya Jibreel, who al kawthar He says, this is the water from paradise that leads to the fountain of kawthar Then the Prophet sallallahu goes on to explain, ثُمَّ عُرِضَتْ عَلَيْهِ النَّارِ فَإِذَا فِيهَا غَضَبُ اللَّهِ وَزَجِرُهُ وَنِقْمَتُهُ Then the Prophet sallallahu was allowed to witness the fire of hell. And it was full of the anger and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His displeasure. وَلَوْ طُرِحَ فِيهَا الْحِجَارَةُ وَالْحَدِيدِ لَأَكَلَتْهَا If a stone or even iron was thrown into that fire, it would devour it as well. فَإِذَا قَوْمٌ يَأْكُلُونَ الْجِيفِ And then of course some of the narrations that we heard earlier, the Prophet ﷺ, but see, the Prophet ﷺ had witnessed a lot of the punishments that some people who had done some very terrible things in the life of this dunya, the punishment they were undergoing as a consequence in the hereafter. The Prophet ﷺ has already witnessed this and mentioned this. But one of those punishments is reiterated here, is mentioned specifically here. And that means that the Prophet ﷺ is reiterating it to emphasize it, that this is a huge issue that the community of Muslims need to be very careful about. And he says, فَإِذَا قَوْمٌ يَأْكُلُونَ الْجِيفِ He saw people that were eating uh, dead animals and carcasses. فَقَالَ مَنْ هَؤُلَاءِ يَا جِبْرِيلِ He says, who are these people, O Jibreel? قَالَ هَؤُلَاءِ الَّذِي يَأْكُلُونَ لُحُمَ النَّاسِ These are the people that used to eat the flesh of people, meaning these are the people that would backbite one another. They would backbite other people. So already this was mentioned before, but it's mentioned again because the Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing that this is a huge fitna for some people. وَرَآ رَجُلًا أَحْمَرْ أَزْرَقْ 
The Prophet ﷺ saw a man who was red and blue, like he was bloodied and beaten. It's a way in there, that's like we say, you know, uh, boozed, bruised and beaten, black and blue. So this man was Ahmar Azraq, he was bloodied, he was beaten, he was in terrible shape. فَقَالَ مَنْ هَذَا يَا جِبْرِيلِ He said, who is this Ya Jibreel? قَالَ هَذَا عَاقِرُ nāqa. This is the man who had uh, killed this is the man that killed the she camel that was given to Salih alayhi salam as a miracle and a testament to the truth of his prophethood. If you remember the story from Surah Hud and from the Quran, that the Qawm Thamud, the people of Salih alayhi salam, they came to the Prophet Salih and they said that, give us, provide, provide a sign to us. And he said, what would you want? And they specifically asked, we want a she camel to come out of this mountain, thinking that they were asking for something ridiculous. And lo and behold, the mountain opens up, Salih alayhi salam makes dua, and the mountain opens up and a she camel comes out from there, emerges from there. But he says that you ask for this miracle, now respect the miracle of Allah. Respect the qudra of Allah. Nobody touches this, nobody lays a hand on it. The story goes on to talk about how they were tested through this camel, because it would eat a lot of the harvest, it would drink a lot of the water, and it was um, something that they had to maintain, they had to look out for. But nevertheless, they ended up slaying that she camel that was a consequence of the miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the dua of a prophet. And the man who launched the arrow that took out the camel, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ in the narration mentions that he's one of the worstly tortured people. He's one of the worst tortured people in the fire of hell because he violated a miracle, a sign from the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayatu min ayatillah. And so the Prophet ﷺ sees him here. And he tells us about him because just like Salih ﷺ had a miracle. And that was that she camel that emerged out of a mountain, came out of like lifelessness. A living creature came out from rock, from stone. And the man who violated it and disrespected it, that was his fate. The miracle of Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ is the Qur'an, is the book of Allah. And the one who will disrespect it will meet a similar fate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. وَرَآ Malik خازن النار. And then the Prophet ﷺ sees the gatekeeper, the supervisor, the overseer of the fire of hell. His name is Malik. He is the gatekeeper and the supervisor of the, the warden, if you will, of the fire of hell. فَإِذَا رَجُلٌ عَابِسٌ يُعْرَفُ الْغَضَبْ فِي وَجْهِهِ The Prophet ﷺ says he was frowning, like he had a very stern face. And he seemed angry from his face. فَبَدَأَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ بِالسَّلَامِ The Prophet ﷺ said salam. If you remember, every single time the Prophet ﷺ was touring throughout the heavens, whether they were the prophets, whether they were the angels, they always said salam to the Prophet ﷺ first because they were waiting for him, so excited to see him. The Prophet ﷺ says salam to Malik, خَازِنُ النَّارِ The warden of hell. ثُمَّ أُغْلِقَ دُونَهُ And then obviously it's assumed that he responded. And in fact the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mentions later on. But he responds to the salam of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ is escorted out from the fire of hell. Because it's not appropriate for Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ to be in the, even near the fire of hell. It was just there so he could see it and inform us about it. And then the gates are shut, the gates are closed. ثُمَّ رُفِعَ إِلَى سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى Then the Prophet ﷺ is taken back up to Sidratul Al-Muntaha, the highest that the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reach. فَغَشِيَهَا مِنْ أَنْوَارِ الْخَلَائِقِ وَمِنْ أَنْوَارِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَمْثَالَ الْغِرْبَانِ حِينَ يَقُدُّ عَلَى الشَّجَرَةِ وَيَنْزِلُ عَلَى كُلِّ وَرَقَةِ مَلَكٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَغَشِيَهَا سَحَابَةٌ مِنْ كُلِّ لَوْنٍ Then the Prophet says when he reached Sidratul Muntaha, if you remember in the previous narration, we talked about how Sidratul Muntaha, there's this big beautiful tree there that is full of nur and light. So the Prophet ﷺ comes there, and then it mentions that it was so lit up with new divine light, that it was completely enveloped the Prophet ﷺ within light and within nur. And the narration mentions that angels came and sat down and descended onto every single leaf of that tree. The Prophet ﷺ in the previous session, he mentions that the leaves of the tree were huge, like the ears of an elephant. And they were encrusted with diamonds and rubies and pearls and gems. Each and every single leaf, an angel descended upon that leaf. And the Prophet ﷺ describes it just like in the evening time, when birds will come and fly 
flock to a tree and they'll cover the entire tree so much so that if black birds sit onto a tree, the tree looks black from a distance. And, and we see it over here sometimes on the, on, the, on the lines and the poles and stuff. It becomes completely black, covered with birds. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ says the angels covered that entire tree, so much so that the entire tree became colored and lit up and overwhelmed with all the different colors of the malaika and the angels. And he was overwhelmed with the nur, the divine light that was descending down upon that place. وَفِي حَدِيثَ أَنَّ جِبْرِيلَ قَالَ لَهُ And Jibreel alayhi salam turns to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and he says, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يُسَبِّحُ Your Lord is doing tasbih, meaning your Lord is speaking. فَقَالَ مَا يَقُولُ What does my Lord say? قَالَ يَقُولُ سُبُّوحٌ قُدُّوسٌ رَبُّ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالرُّوحِ Now when we say سُبُّوحٌ قُدُّوسٌ, we're saying, oh Allah, you are constantly perfect and constantly sacred. Allah is saying, I am the one who is perfect in a state of perfection for all of eternity. I am the one who is constantly sacred. My mention is sacred upon the tongues of my slaves. Rabbul malaikati wa ruh. Allah is saying, I am the Lord, the master, the caretaker, the creator and the sustainer of all the angels and of Jibreel. Sabaqat rahmati ghadabi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces that my mercy overcomes and supersedes my anger. My mercy overcomes and supersedes my anger. One of the things I try to explain in the explanation of this hadith Qudsi, that Allah said this, in the rahmati sabaqat ghadabi. I always try to explain to folks that, you know, a lot of times there's this philosophical question, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about His punishment? Why does Allah tell us about how we destroyed nations? What is part of the benefit? And of course there are many, many, many wisdom, there are many different reasons, there are many wisdoms that are embedded within why Allah tells us anything in the Qur'an. But why specific, one of the reasons why Allah tells us about His, His wrath, His anger, His ghadab, His punishment. He tells us about the punishment in the fire of hell, that if you read it in the Qur'an and you understand what you're reading, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you awake at night. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that? Because after reading all of that, we get an idea of how severe the anger and the wrath of Allah is and then imagine that Allah Himself says my mercy is greater than my anger so then try to try to process try to process how overwhelming and amazing and powerful the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be and this announcement was made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the night of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj so that the Prophet sallallahu could directly receive this from Allah and bring it to us فَتَأَخَّرَ Jibril. Jibreel alayhi salam now steps back a little bit فَتَأَخَرَ So the Prophet ﷺ proceeds forward and Jibreel stays. ثُمَّ عَرَجَ بِهِ حَتَّى ظَهَرَ لِمُسْتَوَى سَمِعَ فِيهِ صَرِيفَ الْأَقْلَامِ The Prophet ﷺ continues on forward. He continues to ascend upwards until the Prophet ﷺ reaches a station and he says there he could hear the writing of pens. سَمِعَ فِيهِ صَرِيفَ الْأَقْلَامِ When a pen writes... On the tablet, the sound that you can hear, the Prophet ﷺ could hear pens writing. And these were the pens that write the maqadir al-khala'iq. What Allah has decreed, what Allah has ordained, what Allah has commanded to be, that will occur with His creation. وَرَآ رَجُلًا مُغَبَّبًا فِي نُورِ الْعَرْشِ And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ saw a man who was basking in the nur of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقَالَ مَنْ هَذَا He said, who is this ya Jibreel? A malakun? Is this an angel? قِيلَ لَا Or excuse me, he doesn't, uh, Jibreel is not there. فَقَالَ مَنْ هَذَا He asks, who is this? A malakun? قِيلَ And that's why he doesn't say قَالَ Jibreel. قِيلَ It was, he received the response. He's been given, divinely been given a response. لَا This is not, a, not an angel. قَالَ أَنَبِيٌ Is this a prophet? قِيلَ لَا قَالَ مَنْ هُوَ Then if it's not an angel and not a prophet, then who is this? قِيلَ هَذَا رَجُلٌ This is a man. Like he's being given, shown the example of a man, basking in the nur of the arsh of Allah. And this is to again, teach a lesson and send a message back home, if you will. هَذَا رَجُلٌ This is a man. كَانَ فِي الدُّنْيَا لِسَانُهُ رَطْبٌ مِّن ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ 
That in the life of this world, his tongue used to remain, the expression in Arabic is, his tongue used to remain moist with the remembrance of Allah. Meaning he would always constantly remain engaged in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ And his heart used to constantly remain attached to the houses of Allah. وَلَمْ يَنْتَسِبْ لِوَالِدَيْهِ قَطُّ And he never was, he never was a, 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 the cause of anything bad being attributed to his parents. He was good to his parents and he was part of his parents' good reputation. فَرَآ رَبَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى And then it goes on to mention that he entered the presence of his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I talked about before, uh, or rather, um, I'll, I'll mention it afterwards, after finishing the narrative, the ikhtilaf bayna sahaba, there was a difference of opinion between the sahaba, whether the Prophet ﷺ actually saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. However, the narrations that mention, and those sahaba who specifically mention that the Prophet ﷺ did not like physically, visibly see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their opinion is taken as the majority opinion of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So what we'll understand this to mean is, he entered the presence of his Lord. فَخَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ سَاجِدًا The Prophet ﷺ immediately fell down into the position of sujood. وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ تَعَالَى عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ And Allah spoke to his Habib صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَقَالَ لَهُ يَا مُحَمَّدْ and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Muhammad, قَالَ لَبَّيْكَ يَا رَبْ I am here, my Lord. He says, ask, O oh Muhammad, whatever it is that you want to ask. فَقَالَ إِنَّكَ إِتَّخَدْتَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Oh Allah, you have taken Ibrahim as your best friend. وَأَعْطَيْتَهُ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا You gave him a great vast kingdom. وَكَلَّمْتَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا You spoke to Musa in a way that he heard you in the life of the dunya. وَأَعْطَيْتَ دَاوُودَ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا You gave to Dawood alayhi salam a huge vast kingdom. وَسَخَّرْتَ لَهُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ And you submitted, subjugated so much of your creation to the will and the command of Dawood. وَسَخَّرْتَ لَهُ الْرِيَاحِ And you even subjugated the winds to the command of Dawood alayhi salam. وَأَعْطَيْتَهُ مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّن بَعْدِهِ And you gave him such a kingdom that nobody deserves such a kingdom after Dawood alayhi salam. وَعَلَّمْتَ عِيسَى التَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلَ You taught Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam the Torah and the Injil, وَجَعَلْتَهُ يُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَصَ وَيُحِي الْمَوْتَ بِإِذْنِكَ And you gave him such a gift that he was able to cure the blind and the leper and bring the dead back to life by your command. وَعَدْتَهُ وَأُمَّهُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And you protected him and his mother from shaytan, the rejected. فَلَمْ يَكُنْ لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا سَبِيلٍ And shaytan had no way to basically interfere with him and his mother. فَقَالَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى قَدَ إِتَّخَدْتُكَ حَبِيبًا I have taken you as my beloved, Ya Muhammad. You are my beloved. وَقَالَ الرَّاوِي هُوَ مَكْتُوبٌ فِي التَّوْرَةِ And the Rawi, the person who narrates this uh, narrative of the journey of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, he recalls, and I've mentioned this in one of the earlier, earlier sessions of the seerah about the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. That it was written in the Torah, Habibullah, that Muhammad is Habibullah, the beloved of Allah. Wa arsultuka lin nasi kafatan wa bashira, kafatan bashiran wa nadira. I have sent you for all of mankind to give them good news, to congratulate them and warn them. Wa sharahtu laka sadarak. I have expanded your chest for you. Wa wadatu anka wizrak. I have lifted the burden away from you. Wa rafatu laka dhikrak. I have elevated your mention for you. 1400 years later, we are sitting here halfway across the world in a masjid talking about the journey and the experiences and the blessings of Muhammad Rasulullah I have elevated your mention for you La أُذْكَرُ إِلَّا وَذُكِرْتَ مَعِي Never will I be mentioned Allah says never will I be mentioned except that you will be mentioned with me La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. وَجَعَلْتُ أُمَّتَكَ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى I've given you a, a nation that will follow you and they will be very balanced. وَجَعَلْتُ أُمَّتَكَ هُمُ الْأَوَّلُونَ وَالْآخِرُونَ I've given you a nation, a group of followers who will enter paradise first, but they will come in the world last. وَجَعَلْتُ أُمَّتَكَ لَا يَجُوزُ لَهُمْ 
uh, and I have given you a nation of followers that they will never be able to engage in any formal ceremony or transaction except that they will have to attest that I am their Lord and that you are my slave and my messenger. And I will give you a nation, a group of followers that their sacred text will be in their hearts. That they will memorize and preserve the Qur'an in their hearts and recite it from memory. وَجَعَلْتُكَ أَوَّلَ النَّبِيِّينَ خَلْقًا وَآخِرَهُمْ بَعْثًا And I have made you the first of the Prophets that was created. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, I mentioned this again in the early sessions of the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ said that, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَآدَمُ بَيْنَ تُرَابِي the, that um, that I was made a messenger. I was made a prophet and a messenger while Adam was still in between the, the, the state of water and clay. While he was still in between these states, I was already uh, made a prophet and a messenger. So Allah tells him that I made you the first of the prophets will be created, but the last of them sent. وَأَوَّلُهُمْ يُقَضَى لَهُ And the first of the prophets that will be entered into paradise, and that will be called forth and presented before Allah on the Day of Judgment. وَأَعْطَيْتُكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ لَمْ أُعْطِيَا نَبِيًا قَبْلَكَ I have given you Surah Al-Fatiha, a gift. No prophet before you was ever given such an amazing, remarkable gift. Surah Al-Fatiha. وَأَعْطَيْتُكَ خَوَاتِيمَ سُورَةِ الْبَقَرَةِ مِنْ, كن من كنز تحت عرشي لم أعطي نبي قبلك. And I gave you the last three ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, a gift, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ السُّورَةِ That this is from a treasure that is under my arsh, and no prophet was ever given such a gift before you ever like this. وَأَعْطَيْتُكَ الْكَوْثَرَ I gave you the fountain of Kawthar. وَأَعْطَيْتُكَ ثَمَانِيَةَ أَسْهُمْ And I've given you eight shares, which means eight major blessings. My blessings upon you is distributed into eight shares. What are they? Number one, Al-Islam, the complete way of life that is called Islam. Number two, Al-Hijrah, migration. A great sunnah and practice of yours is that you will leave your home and go somewhere else to establish the deen of Allah. Number three, Al-Jihad, to strive in the way of Allah. Number four, As-Sadaqah, to give charity. Number five, wasomu Ramadan, the fasting of an entire month of Ramadan. Number six, wal amru bil ma'roof. And number six is to enjoy good. Number seven, wa nahyu anil munkar, to forbid the wrong, the evil. Wa anni yawma khalaqtu samawati wal ard. And I, the day that I created the heavens and the earth, on that day I had decreed, faradtu alayka wa ala ummatika khamsina salatan faqum biha anta wa ummat. And then the eighth gift, the eighth portion of mercy that I have bestowed upon you is that I have mandated, obligated upon you and upon your ummah 50 prayers in a day so you and your ummah go and establish it. This is that point of that conversation now. 50 prayers have been ordained and mandated upon you and upon your ummah. So the Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu in his account of the seerah that he narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, said, said, فَضَّلَنِي Rabbi, My Lord elevated me, gave me great virtue, أَرْسَلَنِي رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا May sent me as a mercy to all of mankind and sent me to all of mankind humanity to congratulate them and warn them وَأَلْقَى فِي قُلُوبِ عَدُوِيَ الرُّعْبَ مِنْ مَسِيرَةِ الشَّهَرِ And he put in the hearts of my enemies um, such intimidation that they would intimidate they would be intimidated by me from a month's journey away I, it was the spoils of war were made permissible for me and my ummah. It was not permissible. It was not permissible for any nation before us. But the spoils of war would be gathered, would be placed up on a high place, dua would be made, and the fire would come down from the sky and devour the spoils of war. It was not permissible for, for anyone to take it home. Nobody would take anything home from battle as spoils of war, but it was made permissible for Muhammad Rasulullah and his ummah. And the entire earth was made a place of worship and a source of purification. 
This is talking about the fact that we can, you know, we can, we can post up anywhere and pray two rakat if we want to. We could be traveling and salah could come up anywhere and we could just pray. We could stop and pray anywhere as long as it's clean. And we can do tayammum anywhere. The nations of the past, they would have to establish a place of prayer and they could only pray in an established place of prayer. But this is a gift to this ummah. وَأُعْطِيتُ فَوَاتِحَ الْكَلِمِ وَخَوَاتِمَهُ وَجَوَامِعَهُ And I was given the gift of amazing, comprehensive speech that opens and closes and is comprehensive. وَعُرِدْتُ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي وَلَمْ يَخْفَ عَلَيَّ تَابِعُ الْمَتْبُوعُ And I was presented upon my ummah, and I know exactly, I was able to recognize who will follow and who will not follow. وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ يَنْتَعِلُونَ بِالشَّعْرِ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ أَتَوْ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ عِرَاضُ الْوِ It goes on to mention some things, I'm gonna kind of browse over this. And then he goes on to say, وَأُمِرْتُ بِخَمْسِينَ صَلَاةً And I was commanded, ordained, obligated to pray 50 times in a day. And then, وَأُعْطِيَ ثَلَاثًا And it goes on to mention that I was told three things. I was told three things on that journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Annahu Sayyidul Mursaleen, that I am the, uh, that it was said about the Prophet ﷺ, an announcement was made in the heavens on the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Annahu Sayyidul Mursaleen, that he is the leader, the head of all the messengers. Wa Imamul Muttaqeen, he is the leader and at the forefront of all those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have a relationship with Allah, وَقَائِدُ الْغُرَّ الْمُحَجَّلِينَ And he is the leader of all those whose limbs will glow and shine on the Day of Judgment. What limbs will glow and shine? The areas that are covered when we make wudu. The areas that are covered when we make wudu, those limbs of the body will glow and shine on the Day of Judgment, and the Prophet ﷺ will be the leader of the, that group of people. So now it goes on, and the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud says, أُعْتِيَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى On the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ was given the following gifts. As-salawatul khams, the five daily prayers. وَخَوَاتِمُ سُرَةِ الْبَقَرَةِ The three last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَغُفِرَ لِمَنْ لَمْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ أُمَّتِهِ شَيْئًا الْمُقْحِمَاتِ that as long as somebody did not do shirk from the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, as long as they did not commit shirk, they did not die upon shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive any other of their sins. As long as they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, it goes on to mention, ثُمَّنْ جَلَتْ عَنْهُ السَّحَابَ وَأَخَذَ بِيَدِهِ جِبْرِيلِ Now the Prophet ﷺ comes back to the place of Sidratul Muntaha, that station where he was enveloped by nur, and the nur dissipated. The nur moved away. Jibreel alayhi salam, and the Prophet is so dazed by this experience. Jibreel alayhi salam takes him by his hand. فَانصَرَفَ سَرِيعًا And they quickly turn around and begin to descend very quickly. فَأَتَى عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمِ فَلَمْ يَقُلْ شَيْئًا They pass by Ibrahim alayhi salam and nothing is said because now they're moving through very quickly. ثُمَّ أَتَى عَلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ Then they pass by Musa alayhi salam and he says, وَنِعْمَ الصَّاحِبْ كَانَ لَكُمْ that this is a very good companion. And he says, مَا صَنَعْتَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ What happened, O oh Muhammad? Tell me. قَالَ مَا فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ رَبُّكَ وَعَلَىٰ أُمَّتِكَ And he says, what did Allah obligate, ordain upon you and your ummah? قَالَ فَرَضَ عَلَيَّ وَعَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي خَمْسِينَ صَلَاةٍ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَىٰ And the Prophet ﷺ says that me and my ummah were obligated, were commanded to pray 50 times a day. قَالَ فَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَاسْأَلْهُ التَّخْفِيف عَنْكَ وَعَنْ أمتك. He says, go back to your Lord and ask Him to lighten the load from you and from your ummah. فَإِنَّ أُمَّتَكَ لَا تُتِقُ ذَلِكَ Your ummah will not be able to maintain that. He says, فَإِنِّي قَدْ خَبَرْتُ النَّاسَ قَبْلَكَ I have experienced people before you, my brother. I have, exp- I have more experience with people than you do. I lived a whole life before you did. وَبَدَوْتُ uh, وَبَلَوْتُ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَعَالَجْتُهُمْ أَشَدَّ الْمُعَالَجَةِ عَلَىٰ أَدْرَىٰ مِنْ هَذَا فَضَاعُفُوا وَتَرَكُوهُ I tested Bani Israel with a lot less than this. But I found them to be too weak and they ended up, you know, skirting their obligations. فَأُمَّتُكَ أَضْعَفُ أَجْسَادًا وَأَبْدَانًا وَقُلُوبًا وَأَبْصَارًا وَأَسْمَاعًا And your ummah is weaker in body and strength and ability than Banu Israel was. They are just physically weaker people. 
They won't be able to maintain 50 prayers in a day. فَالْتَفَتَ نَبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ جِبْرِيلِ يَسْتَشِيرُهُ The Prophet ﷺ turns, it makes sense what he's saying. But the Prophet ﷺ is also wondering like, how do you go about doing that? Right? So he turns to Jibreel alayhi salam, kind of asking him like, what do you think I should do? فَأَشَارَ إِلَيْهِ جِبْرِيلِ أَن أَنَّ نَعَمْ إِنْ شِئْتَ Jibreel alayhi salam tells him, yes, if, if you want to, then absolutely. فَرَجَعَ سَرِيعًا حَتَّى إِنْتَهَا إِلَى الشَّجَرَةً فَغَشَيْتُهُ السَّحَابَ وَخَرَّ سَاجِدًا The Prophet ﷺ quickly turns around and goes back to Sidratul Muntaha. And again, that nur, that that nur envelops him. And the Prophet ﷺ again falls into sujood. وَقَالَ يَا رَبِّ خَفِّفْ عَنَّا He says, my Lord, please make it easier for us. Lighten our load. وَفِي لَفْضٍ عَنْ أُمَّتِي فَإِنَّهَا أَضَعَفُ الْأُمَمِ And he says, oh Allah, please lighten the load from my ummah because they are the weakest of the followers. Very weak physically. قَالَ قَدْ وَضَعْتُ عَنْكَ خَمْسًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have been discounted five prayers. And again, it goes on to mention that he reaches Musa alayhi salam, and again he asks him, okay, what happened now? He says, وَضَعَنِّي خَمْسًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discounted five prayers. He says, go back to your Lord and ask him for less. And he goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَحُطُّ عَنْهُ خَمْسًا خَمْسًا that he, فَلَمْ يَزِلْ يَرْجِعْ بَيْنَ مُوسَى وَبَيْنَ رَبِّهِ He keeps going back between Musa alayhi salam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps discounting five, five prayers. حَتَّى قَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ And until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Muhammad, لَبَّيْكَ وَسَعَدَيْكَ يَا رَبْ He says, Yes, my Lord, I am present. What can I do? قَالَ هُنَّ خَمْسُ صَلَوَاتٍ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلًا لِكُلِّ صَلَاتٍ عَشْرٌ فَتِلْكَ خَمْسُونَ صَلَاتٍ لَا يُبَدَّلُ الْقَوْلُ لَدَيَّ وَلَا يَنْسَخُ كِتَابِ تَخْفِيفَهَا عَنْكَ كَتَخْفِيفِ خَمْسِ صَلَوَاتٍ وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِحْ... And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, oh Muhammad, now these are five prayers, and each one is, is the equivalent of ten prayers. Whoever will pray five, they will still get the reward of the full fifty. And this is written down, this will not be changed, and this has been noted in the divine tablet. And this is written on behalf of you and your ummah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet and this is very powerful. He says, وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِسَيِّئَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا Or excuse me, وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كُتِبَتْ لَهُ عَشْرًا Whoever from your ummah makes just the intention to do a good deed and doesn't do it, doesn't follow up with a good deed, 10 good deeds will be written for that person, just by making the intention to do a good deed. وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِسَيِّئَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا But whoever makes the intention to commit a sin, and does not follow through with it, does not commit the sin, لَمْ يُكْتَبْ, لم يكتب or لَمْ, يك, لم يُكْتَبْ شَيْئًا فَإِنْ عَمِلَهَا كُتِبَتْ سَيِّئَةٌ وَاحِدًا no sin will be written for him if he makes the intention to do a sin but doesn't do it, doesn't commit it. But if he does go through and following up and committing that sin, only one sin will be written for him. But just by making the intention of a good deed, that ten good deeds will be written for that person. فَنَزَلَ حَتَّى إِنْتَهَا إِلَى مُوسَى He finally continues to descend until he meets Musa alayhi salam. فَأَخْبَرَهُ فَقَالَ And he informs Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam says to him, irji ila rabbika fasalu takhfifa in ummatak, fa inna ummataka la tutiqu dhalik. He says, go back to your Lord and ask for even less. Your ummah will not be able to do this. فَقَالَ لَهُ قَدْ رَاجَعْتُ رَبِّي حَتَّى إِسْتَحْيَيْتُ مِنْهُ I have gone, continue to go back to my Lord until I am shy. I am embarrassed to go back to my Lord anymore. وَلَكِنْ أَرْضَى وَأُسَلِّمْ I am pleased, I am happy and I will submit. فَنَادَاهُ مُنَادٍ And an announcement was made at that time. أَنْ قَدْ أَمْضَيْتُ فَرِيضَتِي وَخَفَفْتُ وَخَفَفْتُ عَنْ عِبَادِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have, I have issued my obligation and I have lightened the load and the burden from my slaves. قَدْ أَمْضَيْتُ فَرِيضَتِي وَخَفَفْتُ عَنْ عِبَادِي I have issued the obligation, my obligation upon my slaves, but I have also lightened their load from them. One of the interesting things, the questions that can be asked here is, why this continues back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? Why not just one shot? Of course, it's in the divine knowledge and the wisdom of Allah, right? Allah intended from the very beginning to ordain and to obligate how many prayers? 
That's a part of, we have to believe that. Because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is all encompassing. So it was in the knowledge of Allah, in the infinite knowledge of Allah, that there would be five prayers that would be mandated. Why this continuous back and forth? Two things, two benefits that, you know, I'll share here. Number one, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ, Allah had told the Prophet ﷺ, قَدَ اِتَّخَدْتُ حَبِيبًا I have made you, قَدَ اِتَّخَدْتُ حَبِيبًا I have made you my beloved. The Prophet ﷺ was so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet ﷺ, this five, 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 every single time only five were subtracted so that the Prophet ﷺ would have that many more opportunities to come back and converse with Allah. The love of Allah for His Habib ﷺ was shown by bringing him back repeatedly. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only discounted five at a time to also show us that how much does the Prophet ﷺ care for us, how concerned is he for us, how much does he love us, that he would continue to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over and over and over again to keep having prayers discounted on our behalf because he was worried about us. How many times would you go and ask for a favor on someone else's behalf to someone else, to a third party? How many times? If you, need one, if you needed a favor once, twice, three times, you'd follow up with somebody, because you need it. Somebody else says, you think you could go put in a good word for me? Sure, absolutely. You feel very benevolent one day, you feel very generous and gracious one day. Absolutely, brother, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. You go and you talk to that person, nothing happens, that person follows up with you. Nothing happened, do you think you follow up again? Yeah, sure, inshallah. Right, and then maybe you bring it up a second time. If you feel up to it. If you really have that much clout with that person. The third time that person follows up with you, man, nothing really happened yet. Do you think you follow up again? That's when the text message goes unanswered. <laughs> He's laughing, right? And his brother Shah Rukh does this to people, right? So that's when the text message goes unanswered. That's when the phone calls go straight to voicemail. That's when the emails, you know, just kind of float away into the abyss, right? And, and that's what happens, like, man, I'm not gonna keep going. You even tell somebody, you tell somebody else. You know, you tell Brother Abdullah, like, man, you know, dude keeps calling me, emailing me to keep, you know, talking to that guy for How many times am I gonna talk to him? I told him two times, man, if he doesn't wanna do it, he's not gonna do it. I don't know why that guy keeps putting me in this awkward position. Now I gotta avoid him, and I gotta avoid him. Now I gotta avoid everybody, right? So now this, it becomes this issue. We feel so inconvenienced. The Prophet of Allah keeps going back before his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's okay with praying 50 and 45 and 40 and 35 and 30. He keeps going back to his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keeps asking on our behalf. This is the generosity, the compassion, the care, the concern, the love of Muhammad Rasulullah for his ummah. So this is, these are just a couple of thoughts and reflections that we get from this. And then Musa alayhi salam says to him, Ihbid bismillah, go ahead and by the name of Allah continue to proceed on forward back on your return journey. وَلَمْ يَمُرْ عَلَى الْمَلَئِ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ إِلَّا قَالُوا لَهُ عَلَيْكَ بِالْحَجَامَةِ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ مُرْ أُمَّتَكَ بِالْحَجَامَةِ Something very interesting that every time he passed by a group of angels, they would give advice to the Prophet ﷺ that practice blood cupping. And this is very interesting as well because we know that the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, part of its objective was to console and comfort the Prophet ﷺ after a very difficult time and period in his life. To help him get through a lot of adversity and difficulty. To help him deal with that emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. Physically because his age was increasing. He's older now. The Prophet ﷺ at the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj is past the age of 50. He's about 52 years old. And things are getting difficult and they're about to get more difficult. The ghazawat are about to begin. Once he, he's about to migrate from Mecca to Medina. You know, journey on foot from Mecca to Medina. We have to go on bus and we act like it's like this huge, like, you know, test and imtihan from Allah. Like, man, so difficult, so tough. The Prophet journeys on foot. By camel and on foot, all the way from Makkah to Medina, hiding, ducking, trying to make sure nobody finds him. They're out to get him, there's a bounty on his head. There are bounty hunters after him, trying to kill him, assassins. They're trying to take him out. At the age of 53, he's doing this. At the age of 55, he goes to the battle of Badr. At the age of 56, he's in the battle of Uhud being injured and bleeding. Burying his family members with his own hands. He's going through all of this. At the age of 58, 59, 
He's digging a trench around Medina, tying stones to his stomach, going through starvation, not eating anything for days. Very difficult. Imagine at such an advanced age going through all this hardship. So this was a physical nasiha to the Prophet ﷺ, a physical gift presented to him that to renew and refresh your body, blood cupping was prescribed to him. I don't know a lot about it. I have no expertise in medicine. I don't practice it personally. So you can go talk to a doctor or physician about it, inshallah. Thumma in hadara, then he continues to descend down. فَقَالَ جِبْرِيلَ مَا لِي لَمْ آتِي لِأَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ إِلَّا رَحَّبُوا بِي وَضَحِكُوا إِلَيَّا The Prophet ﷺ, as they're descending down, so you know how you talk to somebody while you're traveling with them? While you're walking, while you're traveling. So he starts talking to Jibreel ﷺ, I'm kind of reflecting on the trip, on the journey. Highlights, right? He says, Jibreel, I have a question for you. Every single time I came by anyone from Ahlus Sama, from the inhabitants of the heavens, they would welcome me and they would smile. Like big old smiles. They would smile at me and they would welcome me. غَيْرَ wahidin, Except for one guy. سَلَّمْتُ alayhi, I gave him salams. فَرَدَّ alayya. فَرَدَّ the salam. He returned the salam, of course. That'd be rude otherwise, right? So he returned the salam. وَرَحَّبَ um, bi. وَدَعَالِي He even welcomed me. He made dua for me. وَلَمْ يَضْحَكُوا وَلَمْ يَضْحَكِ لَيَا But he never smiled even once. It was like, وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامُ Welcome. May Allah give you good. Right? Like that. But it was very like, kind of just very serious. So he says, what is this? Jibreel alayhi salam says, مَالِكْ خَازِنُ النَّارِ That was Malik, the warden of the fire of hell. And he says, لَمْ يَضْحَكْ مُنذُ خُلِقْ he has not smiled since he was created. He's not physically capable of smiling. وَلَوْ ضَحِكَ لِأَحَدٍ لَضَحِكَ إِلَيْكَ And he says, I swear to you, Ya Rasulullah, if he had the ability to smile, he would have smiled at you. Basically, he's saying he wanted to smile at you, but he's not allowed. He's not, he has not been given the ability by Allah. He's not been given permission by Allah to even smile. Alright? So smile. Okay? Everybody, the lesson from the moral of the story, smile. Only the warden of the fire of hell doesn't smile, okay? فَلَمَّا نَزَلَ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا نَظَرَ أَسْفَلَ مِنْهُ When he finally descended onto Sama'u dunya the sky of the world, he looked down, فَإِذَا هُوَ بِرَهَجٍ وَدُخَانٍ He saw smoke and clouds. And he said, what is this, Ya Jibreel? قَالَ هَذِهِ الشَّيَاطِينَ يَحُومُونَ عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِ بَنِي آدَمِ These are the clouds, the groups of the shayateen that swarm. And try to cover the eyes of the children of Adam. لا يتفكرون في ملكوت السماوات والأرض. So that they do not ponder upon the creation of the heavens and the earth. And it's a metaphor. Basically, what it means is that these are the shayateen and how they distract the people of the earth, so that they do not reflect on the greatness of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala around them. ولو لا ذلك لرأو العجائب. If it, if they wouldn't be distracted by the shayateen they would see amazing things, miraculous things all around them that would remind them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. ثُمَّ رَكِبَ مُنْصَرِفًا Then the Prophet ﷺ turns back, you know, heading now back on the way to Mecca. فَمَرَّ بِعِيرٍ لِقُرَيْشٍ And the Prophet is basically traveling through the sky. And they pass by a group, um, a caravan from the Quraysh, that was at a certain place, they had a camel that two huge uh, sacks or bags, like two huge bags, like luggage, was loaded onto that. غَرَارَةٌ سَوْدَى وَغَرَارَةٌ بَيْضَى It was very noticeable because one sack, you know, like kind of like a sack you would hang over and it would hang down on both sides. But what was very interesting about that sack is one side of it, one end of it, half of it was white and half of it was black. Somebody had made a sack like that, but it was very noticeable. You couldn't see it, right? And the Prophet ﷺ saw it. فَلَمَّا حَاذَ الْعِيرِ نَفَرَتْ وَاسْتَدَارَتْ وَصَرَخَ ذَلِكَ الْبَعِيرِ وَانْكَسَرَ Then when they got close to that caravan, the camel began to freak out. نَفَرَتْ وَاسْتَدَارَتْ Which basically means it freaked out and started going in circles like it got... It got, it got kind of frightened. All right? It got spooked, like they would say. The camel got spooked a little bit. And this is because the animals are able to witness a lot of the unseen. The Prophet talks about this, how animals can even hear the punishment going on in the graves. 
what goes on with the dead in their graves. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, if you were to even get a little bit of, you know, you were able to hear it even a little bit, you would stop burying your dead. So they are able to interact with the unseen. They're able to witness it to some extent. So the camel must have sensed that, you know, somebody was there. Jibreel was there. So the camel began to scream. And it sat down. It refused to get back up. And so then the Prophet ﷺ says, he passed by another caravan that was on its way to Mecca. And they had lost one of their camels. فَسَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِمْ The Prophet ﷺ greeted them as he passed by. فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ Some of them said, هَذَا صَوْتُ Muhammad. Did you just hear Muhammad? No, no, what are you talking about? How are you gonna hear Muhammad ﷺ out here, right? ثُمَّ أَتَى أَصْحَابَهُ قُبَيْلَ الصُّبْحِ بِمَكَّةً The Prophet ﷺ reached back right before the time of Fajr. Right before Qubayl. Right before the time of Fajr. فَلَمَّا أَصْبَحَ Then when the morning time came, the Prophet ﷺ realized, it kind of the reality sunk in, that as soon as he goes out and tells them, they're gonna call him a liar. It was such an amazing experience. But that reality began to sink in, that as soon as I go and I tell these people, they're gonna call me a liar. And he sat down and he was very sad. He just sat down, just, it was kind of back, you know, it was, it was back on the job type of deal. Back on the grind. After such an amazing experience to be back with these people who just don't want to hear the truth. It was very emotionally overwhelming. Abu Jahl comes by and sees the Prophet at the Haram, at the Kaaba. He sees the Prophet ﷺ and he comes to him and he sits down and he says, you know, kind of mocking him, Hal Is everything okay? He didn't care. But he says, is everything okay? He figures I might be able to, he seems vulnerable, I might be able to get something that'll be ammunition. So he says, everything okay? And the Prophet says, yeah, everything's fine. He says, what is it? Tell me. And the Prophet says, okay, if you insist. Usriya bi al layla. I went on this miraculous journey last night. And he, tell, and he says, Ila Aina, where'd you go? He says, Ila Bayt al Maqdis. I went to the sacred house of God in Jerusalem. And. And then he says, ثُمَّ أَصْبَحْتَ بَيْنَ أَذُورِنَا And in the morning you're here? He says, yes. فَلَمْ يَرَى أَنَّهُ يُكَذِّبُهُ مَخَافَةَ أَنْ يَجْحَدُهُ الْحَدِيثِ إِنْ دَعَى قَوْمَهُ إِلَيْهِ And then he says that, you know, he didn't immediately reject him so that he could call the people and kind of continue this little show that he was creating. So he says, is it okay with you if I call the people? And the Prophet ﷺ says, sure, go ahead and call them. And he calls everybody there together. So the whole crowd there at the Haram gathers together. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Hadith qawmaka bima haddathani. Tell them what you told me. The Prophet ﷺ tells them, you know, what he told him. And the narration mentions that some people started clapping. Some of them started, you know, kind of like putting their hands on their head, like, you know, sarcastic gestures, some started clapping. They all started mocking the Prophet ﷺ. Mut'im bin Adi. Mut'im bin Adi is a very interesting guy because Mut'im bin Adi was the one who was supported the campaign to end the boycott. The three years of boycott. He had supported the Prophet ﷺ. He's the guy who granted the Prophet ﷺ protection. When the Prophet ﷺ came back from the journey of Ta'if, and the Quraysh said, no, you went out there to get support against us. Right now you stay outside of Mecca. You come back in here, we're gonna kill you. And Abu Talib was not there anymore, so the Prophet was kind of stuck outside of Mecca. Mutim bin Adi was the one who went out and got the Prophet and brought him back to Mecca and said, nobody lay a finger. He has my protection. We can't do this with one of our own. So if you want to say anything the most about Mutim bin Adi, and the Prophet ﷺ even said, later on when the prisoners of war of Badr were taken, the Prophet ﷺ said that if Mutim bin Adi was still alive and he was to ask me to release the prisoners of Badr, I would release them on his word. Because I respect what he did for me. So Mutim bin Adi was sympathetic towards the cause, at least towards the Prophet ﷺ, at the very least towards the Prophet ﷺ. Mutim bin Adi comes and he says that, Everything you've done before today, I tolerate it. Everything you did before today, I tolerate it. I was always in your corner. I don't believe, but I supported you. I, I could tolerate everything. وَأَنَا أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ كَاذِبٌ But this, مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْيَوْمِ Before today, 
Now even I testify that you are a liar. This is crazy what you're talking about. And then he says, we travel for a month, each way, one way, to reach Baytul Maqdis. And you're saying that you went there in the night and came back? He goes, I swear. And he swears by the idols. لا أصدقوك. I swear by the idols that I will not, I will not accept this as the truth. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu reaches the gathering at this time. He stands up and he says to Muta'im, بِئْسَمَا قُلْتَ لِبْنِ أَخِيكَ How could you speak to your cousin like that? How could you speak to Muhammad like that? He says, you call him a liar and you confront him like this in public? أَمَّا أَنَا فَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّهُ صَادِقٌ I testify that he speaks the truth. They, 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 they challenge the Prophet ﷺ. They said, Ya Muhammad, okay fine, describe Baytul Maqdis to us. Describe it. The Prophet ﷺ begins describing it. While he starts describing it, the narration says that he starts to kind of trail off because at the end of the day, he was not there for like an architecture field trip, right? He wasn't there observing and taking notes on the architecture of Bayt al-Maqdis. He describes a little bit of it, but then he starts to trail off and he's like, I don't remember a whole lot because it was nighttime, I was there, I was in the company of all the souls of all the prophets, I was a little preoccupied, right? So he doesn't remember all of it and then the narration says, فَذَهَبَتْ يَنْعُتُ لَهُمْ بِنَاءَهُ كَذَا وَهَيَّتُهُ كَذَا وَقُرْبَهُ مِنَ الْجَبَلِ كَذَا فَمَا زَالَ يَنْعُتُ لَهُمْ حَتَّى إِلْتَبَسَ عَلَيْهِ النَّعْتِ فَكُرِبَ كَرْبًا مَا كُرِبَ مِثْرَهُ The Prophet trailed off and he started to kind of not know what to say next and that would never happen with the Prophet But it was very difficult. فَجِيْءَ بِالْمَسْجِدْ the, the Prophet ﷺ, the, the Baytul Maqdis was miraculously put right in front of the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ. It's like he could see it, face time. Face time. Alright, he could see Baytul Maqdis. And the Prophet ﷺ, وَهُوَ يَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهِ And the Prophet ﷺ started to look at it. And he started to describe it. They said, how many doors does it have? And the Prophet ﷺ is literally looking at it going, one, two, three, four. They're all like, oh my God, what's going on? He says, one, two, three, four. He starts counting the doors and starts describing the doors. Not just counting them. وَيُعُدُّهَا بَابًا بَابًا وَيُعْلِمُهُمْ He starts describing them one after another and starts telling them. And every single time the Prophet ﷺ says something about Baytul Maqdis, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala is sitting right there. He says, this door is like this and it's over here. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala says, Sadaqta, Sadaqta. He describes the next door and Abu Bakr says, Sadaqta, Sadaqta. He describes the third door and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, Sadaqta, Sadaqta. And he keeps affirming what the Prophet says. And finally, when the Prophet concludes, he says, Ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. Ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. I bear witness that you are the Messenger of God. And some of the people that were there in that gathering who had visited Baytul Maqdis, they say, Amma annatu fa wallahi laqad asab. They said that the description of Baytul Maqdis, Wallahi, he got it exactly on the dot. Now it's time for Salat al-Isha, but remember I talked about those caravans that the Prophet ﷺ passed by? The Prophet ﷺ tells them about those caravans and it goes on forward from there. We'll talk about that inshallah next week. It's time for Salat al-Isha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Inshallah, um, since we had a lot of new faces, just keep in mind to follow up with this previous Sira lectures, qalaminstitute.org slash podcast. You can listen to all of them there inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashad wa la ilaha illa anta, nasafiruk wa natubu ilayk.